that, um, I would like to introduce the next speaker. Uh, could you please also share in the meantime your... Yes, so the next speaker is from um, Newcastle University UK, Ahmed Ashar, and he's going to talk about today experiencing magnetism in a two-dimensional noble metal decalcogenite. The floor is yours, please. Thank you. Okay, so thank you very much. Uh, yes, I'm Ahmed Ashar. I'm a lecturer at the Newcastle University in the physics department. So before starting my talk, indeed, I would like to thank the organizing committee for including me into their schedule. So it's really a great pleasure to be here talking about my research. And indeed, this research uh, was conducted at EPFL in the group of Andres Kies before I moved to Newcastle University. So I will be talking about the, uh, the uh, extrinsic magnetism in ultra thin materials. So I understand that uh, it's a bit different than the, the general uh, focus of the COVID. So I will be giving some uh, brief uh, uh, background about the, into the, this uh, material science uh, related to two dimensional materials. So of course, everything started with the discovery of uh, graphene. Uh, researchers from uh, Manchester Uni University in 2004, uh, they, they had the uh, graphite and then they use a very simple method to get like uh, the ultra thin, uh, like the thinnest material ever uh, can possible uh, uh, at the ambient conditions. And this is a material uh, called graphene. It's like just a 0. 3 nanometer and it shows like completely different properties once you thin down from bulk into the monolayer. And then they also demonstrate a lot of uh, uh, groundbreaking experiments and then they got Nobel Prize in, in 2010, uh, six years after the discovery of graphene. So this is like one of the fastest Nobel Prize in the history of, uh, I guess, uh, yeah, the Nobel Prize. And uh, indeed, one of the things which was uh, the most interesting about the, the one of the like the message of graphene was uh, apart from graphite, we have like several other types of the materials which are uh, similarly bonded with uh, each other through the this uh, weekly one there was bonds. So the question is, can we go into the these materials and again by thinning down, can we achieve? some properties which are absent in the in the bulk. Okay, so the answer was yes. And uh, right now we have isolated more than uh, yeah, hundreds of uh, uh, materials. And these materials, uh, uh, they do show like different properties. Some of them are very interesting. So for instance, like graphene is a semi-metal without any band gap. So uh, we have now uh, all different types of the materials uh, with different band gaps. So small band gap materials and uh, very insulating materials, uh, which is like feeling the, this uh, covering the this spectrum. And indeed, uh, one of the reason why uh, uh, these 2D materials is the the hottest topic in the condensed matter nowadays is uh, indeed uh, you, you can get also like artificial device like materials so you can get one of these material and then place on top of another and then you do get like these uh, heterostructure uh, devices so why this is important is uh, uh, basically by combining them uh, either you can uh, you can uh, compensate the weakness of a material, okay? Or you can add like completely new functionalities which are absent in the, in the, in the pristine form. And uh, indeed the, the field has been even like uh, uh, going into uh, becoming like more rich uh, recently with the discovery of this uh, Tivistronic. And uh, basically uh, it was shown that even like the, the, the way that you are uh, uh, aligning these materials, uh, the, the, the electronic properties are completely changing. So for instance, you, if you get like two semi-metal sheet, okay, and then you place on top of each other, uh, you, you can get a superconductivity or you can get like uh, correlated insulators in these materials. So that's the one of the reasons that the, this material system is uh, very interesting. And indeed, uh, since the discovery of graphene, there was always a question, like, can we also get like, uh, a monolayer magnet, so a material which has like a, a spin polarization at the thinnest uh, layer, okay, uh, at the ultimate thickness layer. And uh, the 
answer was uh, even like it was considered to be like impossible, but later on a group at the uh, Washington University and MIT, they demonstrated that a material called uh, chromium iodide, uh, uh, it, it, it does show uh, uh, magnesium at the monolayer limit. Okay, so this material is very interesting. Uh, at the monolayer and also other odd layers, uh, the material is showing uh, uh, is like fully spin polarized. And it was shown that if you have like bilayer, these uh, the spin polarization from uh, both layers are canceling each other at the zero field, and then this material become antiferromagnet. And and then it was shown that all the materials with the even number of the layers, they 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 do show zero magnetization at the at uh, zero field. And then once you start to apply a magnetic field above the coercive, coercive field, then you can change the magnetization direction of the one of the layer, and then it can become like fully spin polarized again, like you you do see here. So these materials they give us the opportunity to 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 have really like layer dependent magnetism, which is not possible with the, these conventionally grown uh, uh, materials. Okay, and then uh, soon it was also shown that chromium iodide is not alone. We have uh, very different uh, materials which have this kind of like layer dependent magnetism, but indeed the, the uh, these spin alignments are all uh, different types. So because of the strong uh, computation between the intralayer and interlayer exchange coupling, we have like all this sort of uh, uh, spin alignments. And uh, now we really have like uh, the material systems which have like, uh, uh, which are layer dependent uh, magnets and also uh, they can be changed. They can have like completely different uh, uh, magnetic orientation uh, ordering uh, depending on the, the material that we will choose. Okay, and indeed, uh, these are not the only magnets that we have. Uh, the, the materials that I just show you, they, they are intrinsic magnets. And indeed, uh, what, uh, what you can do is you can also extrinsically induce magnetism in 2D materials as well. So one of the method is called proximity induced uh, magnetism. What you do is like you, you get a non-magnetic material and then you place on top of a uh, magnetic material. And if the, this proximity interaction length is, is larger than the thickness of the material, then you can induce the, this magnetic uh, property into this non-magnetic material. For instance, it was shown that if you place uh, graphene on Yig substrate, uh, uh, you, you can get anomalous hole effect in graphene. Okay? And the, the second method is like dilute magnetism. And in this case, what you do is, uh, uh, is, uh, is you, you do have like a, uh, you, you put some other tombs on top of the, these materials and then uh, they turn into the uh, magnetic uh, materials. And uh, you can, for instance, uh, uh, check like magnetic doped gallium arsenide or even with the 2D materials recently it was shown that if you dope the tungsten dioxide with vanadium, you can induce the magnetism. And the, the third approach was uh, defect induced magnetism. So this was indeed a topic which had been like discussed since the discovery of graphene. So the idea was uh, you have a material, okay, which is uh, non-magnetic in the pristine form. And then uh, you have uh, some uh, sort of uh, defects in this crystalline structure. And then the material turn into a magnetic one. And uh, there are different ways of doing it. And uh, for instance, it was shown that uh, you can have like grain boundaries uh, uh, in specific uh, direction, then you can have the, the magnetism or you can apply some strain uh, uh, vacancy. So you can remove some of the atoms or you can replace the atoms with the uh, foreign atoms. Okay. And then, uh, so for some of the materials, it was uh, predicted that yes, we can induce the magnetism in this way. But uh, it was experimentally very challenging because the, the formation energy of this atom, the, these defects that uh, induce the magnetism, they are energetically more unfavorable. Okay, so for instance, in the case of the MOS2, it was known that generally, like these uh, metal vacancies are the one uh, who are contributing to the magnetic ordering, and uh, you can already see here that the formation energy for the this metallic one is much higher than the the, the sulfur. 
Okay. And uh, another paper came out uh, indeed around 2019, beginning of 2019, and then they say that the, the metallic vacancy formation for platinum sunlight, it can be much smaller. Uh, and then uh, this also brought us to the, the question of, uh, can we see that this defect induced magnesium in platinum diserenate? Okay. And uh, yeah, today, that's what I will be talking about. I will be uh, dividing my uh, uh, presentation into two half. Uh, first, I will be talking about uh, the electronic structure of this material. Uh, I'm putting this because uh, you will see also, you will also gain the, some uh, idea why uh, there is an emphasis on going from bot to the monolay limit. So what can change? So you will see that this platinum sunnet has like very strongly uh, thickness dependent uh, electronic structure. And then in the second half, uh, I will be discussing about the uh, magnetic ordering in this material with the defects. Okay, so let me start with the ABC of the platinum selenite. Okay, and uh, this uh, platinum selenite is like unlike the other TNDCs, transition metal dichrogenides, which are uh, which have the phase of two H. This material has one TH. Okay, so it's like uh, the whenever someone talks about the monolayer of the platinum selenite, what you need to just imagine is you have like a platinum uh, layer, and then uh, there are also like top and bottom uh, selenium layers. And uh, this uh, material uh, it can be grown through like different uh, methods. So, for instance, uh, you can use the chemical vapor deposition. You can do selenization. Uh, molecular beam epidaxy and also chemical vapor transports uh, to, to grow this material large scale. So uh, this also means that uh, if, if you want to do any application based on this material, it's doable. So the technology is already there. And uh, this material has uh, indeed uh, uh, different types of the electronic structure. So indeed for a long time, it was known that the, the bulk of this material is a, is a is a metal, it's a semi-metal, okay? And, uh, but uh, in 2017, it was discussed that once you go from bulk to the monolar limit, okay, because of the strong interlay hybridization, uh, a, bad, a band gap opens at two layer. So once you uh, thin down this material to the two layer, then the material becomes like a, a, a low band gap material. And indeed in monolayer, the, uh, the, the magnitude of the band cap is even increasing, okay? And which makes the material especially important for the mid-infrared optoelectronic devices. And another promising thing about this material is uh, uh, it, it's expected to have uh, very high mobilities, okay? So it has like a sizable band cap and high mobilities, so which could be quite interesting for the transistor applications. And uh, here you can already see that the, the in, in case platinum selenite is falling into the, the category with the black phosphorus. Black phosphorus is one of the uh, most studied uh, 2D semiconductor. And indeed platinum selenite is also in the same range of the band gap and also the mobility. But the advantage of the platinum selenite compared to the uh, compared to black phosphorus is platinum selenite is uh, air stable. Okay. So I will show you later, but uh, for instance, so many of the, these 2D materials like black phosphorus or chromium iodide, if you, if you isolate them, isolate them and then put on a table for half an hour, you just see that the, the materials are completely disappearing. In the, in the case of the platinum sun that it has like a long-term stability, even ambient conditions at the monolayer limit. So let me show you, uh, a bit of the thickness dependent uh, thickness dependent uh, electronic structure of this material, like uh, just experimental results. And you can already see that if the, the, the material is uh, uh, thicker than 2.5 nanometer, the, the, it's like uh, very conductive indeed. And uh, as the thickness start to be reduced, the conductivity start to decrease. And uh, as you can see already here that uh, as it gets thinner, it starts to give a response to the gate voltage because the material becomes thinner and then you can control the carrier concentration through the electric field, okay? And, but once you go to the limit below the 2.5 nanometer, what we see is the, uh, the material turns into, be, turns into a semiconductor. 
So you can here already see that the material has a off current. And then uh, once you drive the Fermi level for, from the, the gap into the conduction band, you do see that uh, the conductivity start to increase, which is a typical uh, response of a semiconductor. Okay. And, uh, and uh, getting monolayer for this material was nearly, uh, it was extremely challenging. And then we could only get it like last year. And, uh, and then uh, what we could see is the, the monolayer of this material, uh, one can say that it's like fully insulating. So it's like a very uh, insulating material, even the application of the high bias, uh, uh, we don't see really a, a good conductance. And uh, based on the or analysis, you can already see that uh, uh, it, it has uh, this two dimensional variable range hopping type of uh, transport from low temperature to the room temperature with any carrier concentration that we had. So it's an interesting material. It shows metallic semiconducting or insulating properties depending on the number of the layers you have. Okay, and uh, we have also used uh, a technique called ionic liquid uh, to, to measure the to, to measure the, the, the band cap of this material. So basically what it does is like, uh, it allows you to apply uh, more capacitance, like a more uh, effective electric field. Uh, therefore you can really go from the conduction band all the way to the valence band. And then uh, by also using some references at the end of the day, you can just extract the band cap through the transport. So we got the uh, band cap experimental in the order of 2.2 uh, EV. And another interesting thing about the dispolitium cyanide is uh, the material is showing a uh, uh, very low contact resistance. Okay, so compared to the other materials, 2D materials, uh, uh, the material is like semiconductive, and it also suggests that this uh, material itself can be used as a uh, as a contact material to other uh, semiconductors uh, based on the 2D materials. So now I will be talking uh, about the, the platinum selenite case uh, for the magnetic uh, response. So indeed, this is the work which uh, brought our attention to this material. So a group in uh, at Imri in Singapore, they had uh, this prediction that uh, if you have a single or double platinum vacancy in this platinum diselenite, the material becomes uh, magnetic. Okay, so basically they predict the uh, six uh, Bohr magneton per defect uh, uh, for monolayer. And as I mentioned before, it was very challenging to get the monolayer to, to try if it, this material is really magnetic. And we asked all collaborators at EPFL, uh, Oleg Yazir's group, uh, to, to, to calculate if the thicker layers of the platinum cyanide is also uh, magnetic. And indeed, we got a lot of uh, interesting insights, which help us to understand our experimental results later on as well. So uh, what uh, this uh, theoretical calculations saying is, yes, even in six layers, you do see a magnetism, but only if you put the, these uh, impurities on the surfaces, okay? So if you put the, have these defects within the material, basically the magnetism is quenched. So that was uh, the, the, the first uh, result that they got through the calculations. And the second result was, as you increase the thickness, uh, the, the strength of the uh, magnetism was uh, decreasing. Okay, so basically uh, for monolay, it's like six bore magneton per defect. And uh, for six layers, they, they, they calculate only 1.2 bore magneton per defect. Okay, and uh, and then, uh, so this also brought us the question that uh, is it the RKKY type uh, of the interaction that we should expect? Uh, because uh, based on our uh, theoretical uh, predictions, we do see the magnetism only once that these magnetic impurities are on the surface and then they, are, they can only talk to each other through the conduction electrons. And then therefore uh, that could be the origin of the magnetism. Okay, and here how the magnetic exchange coupling depends on the distance between the, these uh, magnetic impurities. 
And then we were also lucky enough that time that there was a uh, RPS measurements uh, done on the platinum cyanide, which show that Fermi wave vector uh, number, Fermi, uh, Fermi wave number, and then we input inside. And then what we saw is uh, uh, quite interesting. So this looks like a parabolic logical uh, picture, but uh, it gives uh, a lot of information as I will be showing you later on the, about the experimental results. So what it says is, as the thickness of the material is increasing, the strength of the magnetism is decreasing, okay? And, uh, but more interestingly, it shows that if you change just like one layer, you can change the, the, the type of the magnetic ordering from ferromagnet to antiferromagnet. So uh, what it, does, it says is like uh, adding or removing one layer is sufficient to change the uh, magnetic ordering in this material. And uh, the question was, do, do we have this kind of really defects, right, in these materials? And we don't grow these materials uh, in our lab, so we, we, we were getting from a manufacturer. But uh, the question was, like, uh, are there uh, this type of the defects uh, in these materials? And we had uh, TM studies, and then indeed, we have a high concentration of the, this type of defects uh, in the material. And also, there was another uh, uh, study done uh, through the SCM scanning tunnel and microscopy, and then uh, and then uh, it was shown that uh, indeed uh, uh, these platinum vacancies exist in this material in the same type of material uh, grown as in our study. Okay, and then uh, we start to make the devices, and I will tell you uh, in a minute, but. Uh, we, we need to do like a comparative study as a function of thickness. Therefore, we wanted to have the same type of the, the width uh, in all the crystals that we study. And also sometimes we were not seeing the, the magnetic response that I will be showing in a, uh, in a minute, okay, uh, in the wider samples. So that's why like we choose only the materials with, which has like a width of, which has a width of uh, less than a micron. And uh, this was the first sample indeed we studied, and then it shows the, the metallic response uh, as we expect because the thickness is about 2.5 nanometer, and uh, we start doing the magnetic measurements. So here I just added a short slide for the, some of the audience who are more familiar with the squid or mock measurements. And uh, this is the typical uh, response you do get with the ferromagnetic samples or with anomalous Hall effect measurements. But if you measure in RxX uh, in longitude, this would be the response that you, you get for ferromagnetic samples. And uh, if the material is like antiferromagnetic and this is the, how this uh, response would look like on MOG, okay? So you don't have any magnetic ordering near the zero and then once you go above the, some uh, uh, some coarser fields, yeah, and then uh, the material become completely, uh, the material become like completely spin polarized. And then if you would uh, measure the resistance of this device, you would get like two plateau system, right? And uh, that's what we will be looking in our devices. So here, let me show you the, uh, the, the results that we got uh, in this uh, sample. And indeed, uh, five out of 11 studied devices were showing this kind of the responses. If you see the magnetic field from positive to negative or negative to positive, then you do see this kind of uh, hysteretic behavior. And, uh, and then indeed uh, the, the change in the resistance, it can be as high as 400 ohm with a MR percent uh, equivalent of six percentage. Okay, and then uh, we could also see that this sample of the ferromagnetic uh, ordering uh, persists up to 13 Kelvin. And uh, here we also plotted the, the, the change of the uh, device resistance uh, with the temperature. And you can already see this uh, up here, uh, which suggests that uh, the suppression of the spin dependent scattering. And if you measured, uh, once we measured the other six devices out of the 11 we characterized, we saw like completely different types of the response, right? Here, this is the response that we see. You, you we, we do have like two plateau system, okay? And uh, depending on the magnetic field we apply, uh, uh, it's like either at the, this state or this state, right? And this also kind of like a, 
signature of signature of the magnetic uh, antiferromagnetic type of ordering uh, that we previously saw with the chromium iodide. So if we combine all the measurements that we were doing, uh, we got in, in, indeed uh, like an interesting uh, observation. So you could already see the these uh, black ones, the black dots are ferromagnetic ordering and then the red ones are uh, antiferromagnetic ordering. And what we do see is like they're alternating, okay? And device to device and it looks like it's depending on the thickness and the magnitude is decreasing as you increase the thickness and indeed above 20 nanometer, we never uh, managed to probe any magnetism even at the lowest temperature. And this looks very similar to the, this uh, Akikawai, simple Akikawai picture we had. And the question is like, really do we have like layer dependent magnetism in this material? And uh, especially our PhD student that time, now he's a doctor, uh, Alberto, uh, he worked uh, very hard to, to isolate uh, 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 these materials. And then what we were looking is getting two materials next to each other, but one of them is like just one layer thicker than the other one. And then we finally get these materials. And then these are like two platinum cyanide ribbons with the thickness just varying uh, one layer. Okay, and uh, if you measure the magnetic response in these devices, you have again this two plateau system, but if you do a measure at the next device, then we, we do see this ferromagnetic type of the response. So it looked like we had a, a layer dependent magnetism by just changing one layer, uh, the, the magnetic ordering is uh, changing in the, here. And indeed uh, we had also a chance to check in another device. So this is like a platinum cyanide. I think it's not very obvious here, but we have uh, uh, at the uh, position where we have the, these arrows, we have like indeed one uh, uh, step height uh, materials. Okay, so this uh, uh, AFM scanner, you could already see. And, uh, and we measured also the, the magnetic response in this device. And we, what we could see is indeed like it's a combination of the both magnetic and uh, antiferromagnetic uh, types of the signal that we see in the same device. Uh, uh, we do believe that some contribution is coming from the, these layers, which have addition layer, uh, and uh, the other ones have uh, uh, just a ferromagnetic response. And uh, recently we have also shown that uh, we have also studied the monolayer and bilayer platinum cyanide, and we, we were curious if the magnetic ordering uh, persists down to the monolayer. But uh, again, like mentioning these devices with the transport at the at the mono limit is very challenging because they are extremely resistive. So what we did is we put a graphene on top and then we use graphene as a probe, uh, as a sensor uh, to sense the, this magnetic uh, response of the, the substrate. And what we do see is like, if you don't have any, uh, if you don't have any uh, platinum cyanide under the graphene, uh, you, you do have a uh, weak localization response, which is typical for graphene, okay? And what we see is if you have one layer of platinum cyanide and two layer of platinum cyanide, uh, we do have again, like different types of the magnetic ordering, uh, which can be probed through the graphene, okay? So uh, let me also briefly tell you, uh, there is also a possibility of having a magnetic response in platinum cyanide if you have, kind of like some foreign atoms, okay? So there were some predictions, calculations. They were saying that uh, if uh, the material is doped with the transition metal uh, uh, atoms, then you might have the magnetism. So the question was, is it possible that our materials are contaminated with the foreign atoms? And that's why we, we do see this magnetic response. We, we, we work very hard to exclude this. Indeed, we did like a lot of TM scanning and uh, uh, XRD, EDX, uh, ICPMS and Raman characterization, and we couldn't uh, detect any existing atoms. So we do believe that the origin of this signal is coming from the uh, defects in platinum cyanide. And we also believe that it depends on the concentration of the, these defects. Okay, so I think uh, uh, I need. I have uh, only a few minutes left, and I will be uh, briefly discussing uh, why uh, this material is uh, 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 interesting. Okay, so this platinum cyanide, first of all, it can be grown large scale, and then it can be also uh, uh, transferred. So 
from one subset to another one. So it could be used in the applications. And also you can already see that uh, it's very air stable. So even like three months after uh, the, the material is uh, uh, still stable and the magnetic response uh, after 250 degree of annealing is still uh, uh, stable. But if you compare, for instance, any of the, these uh, intrinsic magnets that I introduced at the beginning of my talk, you will see that they are extremely air sensitive. So if you have a chromium iodide and if you isolate it, and if you expose the air in 80 seconds, as you can see here, it completely degrades, okay, disappears. And even if you encapsulate, the encapsulation is only uh, 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 like uh, uh, protecting it for only several hours, even uh, its property changing along the way. And uh, another cool thing about this magnetic order, uh, this uh, extrinsic magnetism in the platinum cyanide is uh, depending on uh, the, the defect concentration, you can really manipulate also the magnetism. So it gives you an opportunity to do atom by atom uh, the control of the magnetic ordering in these materials. So depending on if you are growing your material under the selenium rich environment or platinum rich environment, then you do have a uh, uh, different type of the uh, concentration, okay? And the material is also layer uh, dependent uh, uh, electronic structure, so therefore it can be used as a magnetic insulator or a conducting magnet in several applications. And in summary, the, the material is uh, showing like thickness dependent properties. It's a uh, metal uh, in bulk, semiconductor in 2.5 nanometer below, and uh, a monolayer insulator. And uh, the material is also showing the magnetic response. Uh, Above 20, uh, below 20 nanometer, and it looks like it has a thickness dependent magnetic ordering. And uh, let me put the, this last slide. And indeed, uh, uh, Isidore Rabi, he was asked at Columbia University uh, about uh, this material science, and uh, he, he said that there is no need to study physics of dirt at Columbia physics at that time. But uh, I think uh, uh, this uh, study is already showing that if you can use these defects in a, a, a good manner, then you can induce uh, some properties, interesting properties, which are absent in their pristine form. And with that, I would like to thank the, uh, my collaborators, uh, especially the, of course, the Prof. Andres Kis, who was the, the who is the uh, leading the that group, and also the theoretical support from Oleg Yazev and his uh, PhD student Michele. Uh, yeah. So that's all. Thank you very much. Hey, thank you very much for this very interesting topic on and introducing us the magnetic properties of two D materials. Um, Actually, there, is a, there was an earlier question on the chat, but let me start with the last one first. Um, so again, Ozhan is asking, how did you transfer monolayers and stacks onto the FTM grid? Is it difficult to handle oil or spinning PMMA? Yeah, I think um, we spent around one week uh, to figure out this. Uh, so uh, yeah, uh, with a simple water assisted transfer, uh, you can do the transfer. And uh, yeah, if you want to get, a, of course, good imaging, you need to also take care of the cleaning after the transfer. So we do do some annealing under argon, hydrogen, or vacuum conditions. So I'm happy to give the details if he contacts me, if he has to give his contact information, or he just send me email. Okay, excellent, thank you. And um, there was one other question. I think it differs mostly to the beginning of your talk where you talked about the superconductivity in 2D materials. Um, superconductivity at which temperature? Oh, you so, on this? yeah, uh, these materials, uh, uh, they are called magic angle uh, materials. Uh, so, if you have two graphene sheets on top of each other, and then if you twist them with a 1.1 degree and then superconductivity appears, uh, critical temperatures around 1.5 Kelvin. So it's like extremely low, but uh, uh, it gives a, uh, like it's really a deep uh, topic. So, but uh, uh, 
you you can control the TC as well by changing the number of the layers and uh, that's the whole motivation. So if you keep twisting them and then onto the bulk, so there are some theoretical predictions that you can even go to room temperature mechanism. So it's a uh, one of the hottest research topic right now in the in the research of 2D materials indeed. Okay, it seems like there's a quite an improvement since the beginning of the materials. Okay, and one uh, last question from Lawrence Boschier. He's asking, can you comment on the topological properties of the material? Yeah, so this is a good question. And uh, uh, this material, based on the RPS measurements, it looks like uh, it has the type, uh, type two uh, veil uh, properties and uh, it has like direct cones and uh, the, the issue with the experimental, uh, like uh, the way that we are doing the transport measurements is these uh, direct nodes are uh, far away from the uh, Fermi level. So we need to be able to dope it to be able to access to these uh, topological parts of the platinum cyanide. Yeah, it, it does uh, really interesting uh, topological properties, uh, but uh, they are not really that accessible with the uh, regular uh, uh, oxide-based uh, dielectric. So you need to apply the electric gate, uh, the double uh, electrolyte gate to be able to access this, uh, uh, this type of the physics. So I think it's uh, quite uh, unexplored, but uh, uh, based on the RPS measurements, uh, we do know that it has uh, some topological behavior. Okay, excellent. Um, I don't see any other questions or comments over here. Uh, I hope I don't miss any. Um, it seems like that's all. And we would like to thank you once more. It's a pleasure. Um, thank you so much. Thank you for joining us.